All right, open your Bibles, if you will, to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, where we are going to finish the conversation that's, that we started a few a couple of weeks ago between um, the Pharisees the, and the, um, the scribes and Jesus. So we're going to look at we're going to look at verses 14 through 23 today, but I want to go back and read, starting with verse 1, and just kind of recap and, and remember what this conversation was all about. And it was really about an accusation that the Pharisees had leveled against Jesus. So let's look at uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem... They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Verse 5, and the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men you leave the commandment of god and hold to the tradition of men and he said to them you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of god in order to establish your tradition for moses said honor your father and your mother and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die but you say <clears throat> if a man tells his father or his mother Whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. So this conversation uh, took place between the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus, and they traveled, remember, some traveled some, uh, some 90 miles to get to where he was. They were, they were following him and not following him because they wanted to really hear what he had to say. And they were interested, in, they were interested but they wanted to accuse him. And, and they were coming against him. And they were looking for anything that they could find to do that. And so they accused him this time in a roundabout way. They observed that his disciples were, were eating with defiled hands we're eating with unwashed hands now again as we pointed out a couple of weeks ago this has nothing to do with with uh, you know uh, trying to be clean eat with 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 clean hands it has nothing to do with that it had everything to do with uh, ceremonial uh, cleansing it had everything to do with the laws that the, and, and the ceremonies and the traditions of the pharisees so they accuse Jesus, and they ask him in verse 5, and this is the whole conversation is around this accusation in verse 5. Why do your disciples not hold to the tradition of the elders? And then as we saw last week, he didn't really answer the question, but he comes back at them and said, you hypocrites. How's that for an answer? But that's the way that Jesus handled this situation. And so he pointed out how that they were circumventing the, the law of God, that they held the tradition of the, of the Pharisees even above the law of God and even getting around the, the, the word of God, even getting around verse 10, for Moses said. So he says, for the word of God says, verse 11, but you say. And so again, they're circumventing the word of God, getting around the word of God by their traditions. And they had come to hold the traditions higher than the word of God. And if we hold anything higher than the word of God, we are in the wrong. We are in serious error if we hold anything of more value than the word of God. And so 
this conversation now will go to the rest of the people. So let's look at verses 14 through 23. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The notion that human beings are basically good still persists in the world in spite of constant evidence to the contrary. Popular psychologists and secular anthropologists insist that evil is not inherent in people. Consequently, the blame for destructive behaviors is, is ultimately, ultimately placed on external forces and environmental factors. Other people are bad, not me. It, it's, it's them. We, we make this comparison this way. We compare ourselves to each other when the comparison is, should be made this way. And when we compare this way, when we compare ourselves to the holy and righteous God, we recognize and realize we fall. We, we're not even in the ballpark. And so this proud excuse that, you know, other people are bad, not me, they are easily formed by this deceptive human heart. Unwilling to acknowledge their own guilt, these perpetrators, human beings, often claim to be victims, faulting parents, peers, circumstances, and other things for their criminal behavior. But a biblical understanding of human nature says the exact opposite. Paul, in Romans 3.23, says, For all have sinned. One of the things that I love best about the cross, among many, many, many things, but when we look at the cross and look at what Jesus has done, when you look at the foot of the cross, it's level ground. Nobody's any better than anybody else. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul goes on in Romans 5, verse 12. Death spread to all men because all sinned. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The Bible mentions the heart over a thousand times. And in essence, it's what the Bible says, the heart is that spiritual part of us where our emotions and our desires dwell. And so Jesus here in this conversation he turns his attention from the Pharisees and the scribes, and now he's addressing all people, including the Pharisees and the scribes that were there, and including the uh, disciples that were there. And he's telling them, he begins to tell them, the problem is not on the outside of man, but rather the problem is within man. So in other words, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The human heart is desperately wicked. Now, the Jewish people of, of Jesus' day also misunderstood the basic truth about where corruption and defilement came from. They thought that uh, moral defilement and contamination came from external sources. And again, today, people think that same thing. And they, though, they developed this elaborate system 
of external rituals and ceremonies that they thought would make them pure or make them right with God. They, they gravely assumed that if they looked good on the outside by attending the synagogue or honoring the law or observing the traditions of the elders, that God would deem them righteous on the inside. We don't see that today, though, right? Oh, I've got to go to church. I, I've got to check that off the list. I've got to make sure that I'm there every time the doors are open. Yep, Lord, I was there this time, and Lord, I was there this time. And, oh, I, I read my Bible five times today. Aren't you happy, God? We do do that today, don't we? But we're not made right with God by the things that we do. We're already defiled. That's the point that Jesus is making here. We are already defiled. So Jesus confronts this system of these traditions of, you know, what makes a person defiled. Now, this word defile that Jesus used here is the word koinou, koinou, and it just means to pollute. It means to make unclean. And if you notice, Jesus uses this word five times in this passage. And so as he begins to speak to the crowd, he turns his attention to the crowd. He calls the people to him again and said to hear me, said to them, all of them, hear me, all of you. Hey, listen up, pay attention. I want you to hear this, understand this. He says, there's nothing outside a person that by, by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. So with these words, Jesus took on the whole rabbinical system of ritual purification. Remember, that's how this whole, start, this whole thing started. They saw the disciples, and they, they just grabbed some food, and they began to eat, and, and they didn't wash their hands properly. Now, when you look at what that meant, they had about enough water to hold uh, the, the, for about, that would fill a, a one and a half eggshells, and they would hold their hand up. They would pour that water over their hand. The water would come down over their hand. They would close their fist, and then they would take their fist like this and kind of wash the other. And it was all ceremonial nonsense. It, it, it wasn't about making sure that they didn't have dirt on their hands. It wasn't about cleanliness. It, it was about ceremonial tradition. And so Jesus here takes on this whole rabbinical system of, rabbi, uh, of, of ritual purification and elaborate food and cleansing regulations. We can read about that in Leviticus 11, things that God handed down, things that God, you know, in the Mosaic law handed down to them. And again, they weren't handed down to them to make them clean. But again, the law was given to show that we're not clean. The law was given to show that we need to separate ourselves. We need to be separate from you know, the chosen of God, those that are walking with God. We need to be separate. We need to live lives that are separate from those that aren't. And Jesus said, it's not what you eat. It's not what you drink. Nothing from the outside defiles or contaminates you, but rather... The defilement that offends God is internal. It's a spiritual matter. It's, it's the internal source, the heart. Sinful pollution lies within. We've said it before. I've said things, and, and you've probably said things and heard things, and, and we hear about the horrific things that people do, and we think, man, how can they do that? But we fail to recognize that we are capable of such things. The human heart is desperately wicked. Jesus, in this conversation in Matthew's gospel, says, It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of, a mouth, of the mouth. That's what defiles the person. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when Jesus spoke of the things that come out of a person, he was referring to not only the person's speech, but also the desires, the thoughts, the attitudes behind the speech. You know, I've said it many, many times. 
if you want to know what's in your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's in your heart, lay your thumb down on a table, take a hammer, get you a good size hammer, whack your thumb with a hammer and listen and, and, and see what comes out of your mouth. And if you're like me, you'll know there's work to be done. <laughs> out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and, and think about this. We, 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 we try to be good Christians, right? We, we try to do right. We try to speak right. We try to do things right. And, but what happens when you get angry or what happens when somebody cuts you off in traffic? And What are some of the things that you say or what are some of the things that you do? We need to be uh, mindful of those things. You know, I, I've said this many times as well. Um, it, <clears throat> if you have a foul mouth, that means you have a foul heart, and, and there's only one cure for that, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, food ends up in the stomach, but sin begins in the heart. The food we eat is digested and waste evacuated, but sin remains, and it produces defilement and death. And so here... Now he's, he's addressing the crowd, but he leaves the crowd in verse 17, goes into the house, possibly where he's been staying, with his disciples. So away from the crowd, he and, he and the disciples enter the house, and, and he's now able to communicate more uh, intimately with his disciples, and they ask him about the parable. And his reply in verse 18 are you also without understanding? Don't you get it? Do you still not get it? Now he begins to share more in detail. And again, he talks about the heart. And again, as Ron has been talking about, um, it's not the physical organ that we're talking about, but it's the inner person. It's the, it's the seat of our emotional, mental, and spiritual being. It's the core of our being. It encompasses, encompasses our attitudes, our affections, our priorities, our ambitions, our desires. That's what's rotten inside of us. That's where we're defiled. So in other words, we're already defiled. We come into this world already spoiled, already defiled. And so Jesus here says that something physical or external like food eaten with unwashed hands cannot defile the inner person because the condition of our heart before God is not determined by what we eat. Which, by the way, here, and Mark parenthetically points out here in, G in verse 19, since it, uh, you know, he's talking about the food, and parenthetically, Mark points out here that Jesus is declaring all foods clean. Now, that must have been a shock to their systems. Because all of their lives, they have, they have been living, trying to live according to Leviticus, Leviticus 11, according to the Mosaic laws, the foods that they were allowed to eat, the foods they weren't allowed to eat, things that made them unclean. And, uh, you know, here he... he <laughs> He gives them some shocking news. The food's not what makes you unclean. That, that just probably reverberated in their minds, and, and they still didn't really get it because when you go on and you read, and Peter continued on in the Mosaic law of the foods until we get to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, Peter's up on the house, up on the roof, and he falls asleep, and the Lord gives him a vision, and this sheet comes down, and all kinds of animals, and the Lord says, go ahead, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, I can't eat. I can't take anything in that will, that will defile me, that will make me unclean. Don't call anything, the Lord says. Don't call anything that the Lord has made unclean. And Peter's so hard-headed, like some of us, he had to give him that vision three times, and he still didn't get it until he goes to the house of Cornelius. And then he's like, oh, maybe that's what he's talking about. And so the point that he was making is, is not about really the food. It's really about that 
Even the Gentiles are included into the plan of salvation. Everybody's included. Everybody's heart is defiled. Everybody has sinned against the holy and righteous God. We're all included in this. And so, again, with this statement, Jesus obliterated the dietary laws of Judaism and declared all foods clean. The source of all wickedness is from within. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. He goes on and he goes into this long list in verses 21 and 22 for from within, out of the heart, out of the core of our being, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. One commentator said this, it's not an unwashed, it's not unwashed hands that defile a person, but an unwashed soul. It's the unwashed soul that causes the person to be born defiled. And so the question that arises, how can we then be made right with God? How can, be, how, how can our souls be washed? How can our souls be purified? And the answer is simple. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Romans talks about this. Paul in Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love in this way, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then a passage that uh, Ron was quoting earlier, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's only one way. There's only one way that our souls can be washed. There's only one way that our hearts can be made right before a holy and righteous God. Salvation is not dependent upon the deeds of people whether it be moral works or religious ceremonies or external rituals, it requires an internal miracle by the Holy Spirit who creates and cleanses the souls of all who embrace Jesus Christ in faith. Paul wrote this to Titus in Titus 3, 5. He says, he saved us. Notice he says, he saved us. It's not something that we've done. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. There's only one way to be clean. There's only one way to be made right before a holy and righteous God, and that's faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the cross of Christ. Think about it. If we could be made right with God in and of ourselves, why on earth would Jesus ever leave heaven? Why would he ever come to the earth? Why would he ever become one of us? We're getting ready to celebrate the event of Christmas. <clears throat> you know, it's not about the gifts and the trees, and, and I love all of those things, and the lights, and it's, it's a festive time of the year, and, and it seems to be that time of the year where people are more apt to listen and willing to hear what the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is. But it's not about that. It's about the event that happened. That God came to the earth in Jesus Christ, became one of us. What an amazing miracle that is. What an amazing act of love and grace and mercy that is he didn't have to do that i don't know about you but i would have said sorry it ain't happening i'm not going to do that but god didn't do that before the foundation of the world and that just absolutely blows my mind before the foundation of the world it was in the heart of god to send his son into this world to become the substitute for us. To become, to be the sacrifice for us. 
God did what God couldn't do. Think about this. God always was. He never had a beginning, never has an ending. He always was, never wasn't, always will be. But God, the Son, died. And the way that he did that, the way that he could do that, was to become one of us. Jesus Christ put on flesh. He was 100% man and 100% God. Came to the earth, born of a virgin, grew up as a man, lived a perfect, sinless life. Gave us an example to see what that looks like. And all of that he did for us so that he could go to the cross and be humiliated. But as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2, that he humbled himself. He humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant and even dying on a cross in our place. But he didn't stay dead. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He didn't stay dead. Death couldn't defeat him. The grave couldn't hold him. On the third day, he was raised to new life, and he defeated death, hell, and the grave for those that will put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And which, by the way, when that happens, when he saves us, when he transforms us, when he gives us a new heart, we are new creatures in Christ, there will be a noticeable difference. You will know it, and those around you will know it. You cannot. I said this many, many times, and I believe it with the core of my being. You cannot have had a genuine encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and remain the same. You absolutely cannot, because he gives us a new heart. Praise God for that. Would you pray with me? Father, once again, we thank you. What an amazing gift the Lord Jesus Christ is. What an amazing act of love and sacrifice that he came to go to the cross on our behalf. Give us ears to hear what you would have to say. Renew our hearts. And God will be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.